Welcome to Real Estate of Mind, a farming group podcast. Happy 2017, everyone. Welcome to Farbman Group's Real Estate of Mind, our first segment of the year, and I can't think of a better way to start it than talking to Doug Fura, our Senior VP of Industrial. Uh, Doug has over 35 years of experience in industrial real estate, uh, by far one of the uh, biggest names in the industry, and very fortunate that he has spent over half of his career over here at Farbman Group. Doug, welcome to the show. Hey, Andy, how are you? Doing Thank you for the kind words. Well, just telling it like it is, Doug. So, Doug, I think, you know, being that we're just starting off 2017 and everyone wants to know what's going to happen this year, new president, things have changed in the economy. Uh, let's talk about specific to the industrial segment of commercial real estate. What what can we expect to see in 2017? Well, we're going to see a lot of changes. Uh, some of these changes we, we, we projected as, as long as two years ago. Uh, we saw that there was a fairly rapid expansion of absorption of ind industrial buildings with very little, if any, speculative construction. So we are absorbing existing product and not adding any new product into the market and eventually that becomes a supply and demand issue. Uh, this year I think we're really going to hit the wall when it, with regard to the availability of existing buildings and even the availability of land because we still are not seeing any new construction or at least not any speculative construction. We're seeing some build the suits, we're seeing some opportunities where developers are site plan approving buildings uh, getting them ready to build, but capital is not available for uh, speculative construction very readily. Uh, existing buildings are gone. We're seeing deals right now in, in some areas where buildings don't even hit the market. Tenants are losing out on buildings or buyers are losing out on buildings because there's multiple opportunities for the same product and there's some scrambling to try and get things accomplished right now. You know, one of the things, Doug, when, when I talk to the lending community, one of the challenges they have in lending on, you know, we talk about the lack of available space and spec product, and one of the things they struggle with is that a lot of times the leases for industrial still are so short term that, you know, it, it makes the lenders skittish about investing in product that I've got a one-year lease, you're going to build a new building for that and expect me to back that. And on the other side, the investors are saying, I don't want to do a personal recourse guarantee with a one-year lease. Have you been hearing the same type of chatter? Yeah, that, so we saw that in the last couple of years. That, that was one of the reasons why we thought we would come up to this wall. Uh, developers don't want to spec anything because of the short-term nature of a lot of the industrial buildings and the industrial leases. However, even the auto companies, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, are, are seeing that the problem exists, and they're now extending their contracts and their commitments to their suppliers. So we are now seeing 10, 12, and even 15-year leases being offered on some of these existing buildings. It's a requirement, if we're going to do a build to sue, that you have at least a 10-year deal. We're seeing 12 and 15 year deals being, you know, being bandied about. So for the first time in my career, um, deals of 10 and 15 years are becoming, I don't want to say the norm just yet, but I think they're going to be before the, this year's out. So those organizations that, that really need the industrial space, like the automotives, are starting to see that it has to occur, especially if you're going to do business in Michigan. You've got to you know, help your, whether it's a supplier or a direct deal, you've got to do the longer term leases in order to create a new building. Yeah, and you've got two things driving it. You know, the, the landlords also took a pretty significant hit during the recession. You know, they were doing six month leases, one year leases. They were going from a four and a half dollar square foot lease to, to three and a half dollars or three bucks just to keep a tenant on a month to month basis to ride through it, but they see that this is an opportunity to 
not necessarily make up for what what happened in the recession, but certainly to stabilize their portfolio. And when uh, you talked about lenders requiring it, but the, the the landlords requiring it too, even on an existing product, even if the lender's not involved. If they have an opportunity, for, I, I'm working right now. There's a two-year deal on the table, and we've got a proposal for a five-year deal. We've countered both at ten years. Um, and and both are seriously considering going 10 years. At a minimum, I think we'll get between five and seven years um, for, for both both users. It makes the lender happy, it makes the lender's financing more attractive to, to, the, to the owner and helps stabilize their product for, for an extended period of time. And if we do get another recession, which we're going to, the landlords will hopefully be able to ride out a little bit better. For sure. All right, Doug. So knowing that, you know, this is a unique market, at least in, in recent history, and there are some of the challenges you just referenced, you know, what's, what's the importance of utilizing uh, the services that you provide uh, as, you know, a, a very knowledgeable individual in industrial? Uh, how do you help tenants or landlords or both navigate this odd circumstance? Well, you're right, Andy. We are in an odd circumstance. We're in a market that... Um I don't think I've ever seen in 35 years where we have very little product and multiple people looking at the same deals. If a tenant is is looking for a building or if they're, they're anticipating a renewal and they don't understand the market truly, and if they're currently, if they did a deal back in 08 or 09 and they're paying $3.70 a square foot and they're coming up for either an expansion or renewal of their existing facility, and they're budgeting four dollars a foot or four fifty a square foot. Um, they could be undershooting the market. They could find themselves in some financial uh, difficulties because they, they 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 undershot what they thought the market might be. Uh, or in in some cases, as we've seen recently in a couple of deals that I've been working on, the tenants brokers did not understand the market and didn't truly understand that there was competition out there. They thought it was broker speak that we had two other deals you know, backing up their deal and they kept pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope and ultimately lost the deal. And now they're in a bad position because they have no place to go. Uh, so it, it's important to, under, to utilize a broker from a tenant's perspective that truly understands the market and understands that there are very competitive situations out there and prepare them for it and put them in a position to win the business or win the lease. And on the flip side, from the landlord's perspective, if they don't understand the market, they're going to find that they're leaving money on the table. A lot of these landlords you know, back in the recession took some pretty significant reductions in lease rates in order to keep their buildings full. And today, you know, they, they may not realize they've got a renewal coming up and, you know, they figure they can get the guy from $3.50 a square foot up to $4.25 a square foot, and they're happy. They just got a big increase in rent. But the market might actually give them 5 bucks a square foot. So are they leaving money on the table? Uh, those, those are important issues why a, a, a quality broker that truly understands what's going on in the market and what's going on in the market over the next 12 months are going to be very important. Very good points. You know, what, I, what I've often found interesting, and sometimes, uh, you know, many people in the industry don't understand, is a lot of times if you've got someone who makes widgets, for instance, their contracts are tied in many times with their lease expiration date. So you'll see that same factory being bid. Suddenly you have three people, three groups that are coming in and saying, I want to lease your premises because all are vying for that same contract. And if they don't understand, to your point, if they don't understand um, what the market is, what they're paying rent on, they're all bidding for that widget contract. But the one who's got that knowledge will make sure that they're covered when the time comes to go after that contract. They've got to build in that component of rent to their cost of uh, soliciting the contract. Many times if they undershoot that, they can find themselves in a negative position or out of business just by missing that mark as a piece of that. No, that's a great point. It, it, it's happened time and time again as, as a logistics business in the automobile industry has, has grown. That has been the way it's grown. You know, GM or Ford or Chrysler will, will put a contract out to bid into three or five different logistics 
companies, and they are all looking at the same product. In some respects, that has driven up prices. Uh, I think the auto companies are getting a little smarter to that. But now, I've seen some cases where the logistics provider has gone out there and secured the building before even getting the contract in anticipation that if they have the only building in a town or the best building that from a transportation standpoint and they control that building, then they're going to get the business. We've been able to do that on a couple of cases where logistics companies have um, are in a competitive situation and there's really only one good building out there and before they get the business, they commit to the lease. Now, it takes some, there's some risk associated with it but uh, it's a calculated risk, and it, it can put you in a, in a pretty good advantage to secure business from your customer if, if you understand the market to that extent. That's a good point. And interesting enough, you talk about the risk that the tenant's taking. The landlord on the other side also suddenly has some risk if that tenant does not get the contract that they tied it up for. So on that side, having your services to help navigate while you don't give financial advice, you certainly ask for the right documentation that can give that landlord some comfort that if they don't get the contract, that tenant doesn't get that contract they're bidding on, they still are a viable tenant for the building. So having that expertise certainly helpful. Really appreciate that. Doug, any pieces of advice that you would have for the industrial community? Yeah, Andy. Um, you know, historically we've we've said when you have something coming available or when your lease is expiring in four to six months, now is the time to start looking. But because of the tightness in the market, because of the uniqueness in the market, even if you're in early 2018 or mid-2018, now is not too early to start planning. You know, sit down with a good broker, hopefully it's me, um, to, to, to understand the cost, understand the timelines, understand the changes in the marketplace so that you can budget appropriately, both from a landlord and a tenant side. Uh, get with somebody like myself as soon as possible to, to get your arms around the market. It is not too early to start 12 to 18 months ahead of time. And so, Doug, if people want to get a hold of you, obviously, you know, you're willing to invest some time with them to give them some initial thoughts on it. But if they want to get a hold of you, Fura, F-U-R-A, at Farbman.com. Yes. 248-351-4397 is how they get you. That's the best way? Yeah, that's absolutely the best way. And you're right. We don't charge for our services initially. You know, I, I've, I've been a relationship guy all my career. Uh, what I look for is that long-term relationship. Our fees are generated by commissions when the deal happens. But, you know, there's some oftentimes two, three, four years in advance of consulting and uh, guidance before a transaction takes place, and that's not going to cost you anything. Well, that's what I like best, not only with what you do, Doug, because you've built a great career about being that relationship-oriented service provider, but it's also you know one of the strengths of the Farman Group is that the people that are here as a company, as individuals, and as a whole really focus on what's in the best interest of the client. We're not looking for the short-term dollars. We're looking to make an impact on the future of a client and uh, and be there for them when they have the need. So I commend you on that. I want to thank you for all the years of service here at Farbman. I um, want to thank you for being a part of today's show. And with that, from Andy Gutman and Doug Fura, thank you all for listening to Real Estate of Mind. Join us next time for another wonderful edition of Real Estate of Mind, a Farman Group podcast.